So good morning to you. I understand it's quite early over there. Yeah, um, yeah, 4.35 in the a.m. now, Tony. But it's quiet just time, so that's all that matters. Well, the Canadians, you just got done partying then, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've, we've just put away our Hudson's Bay blankets and our lumberjacks uh, jackets and our hatchets and our axes. And, uh, yes, and uh, the seals are uh, gleefully playing in the, in, the, in the ocean, in the backyard, that is, yeah. Now, when I first started watching you, you were called Under the Stairs Bruin, and then you changed to the Thrifty Brewer. Where did Under the Stairs come from? What was that all about? Um, basically, because I was doing all my brewing in the basement. Um, and it was uh, close to the stairs. And my house is about 100 years old, and I've got six-foot ceilings. So I kind of, if I walk between the rafters... I'm I'm okay, but many a time I'd be carrying you know equipment up the stairs and down the stairs and smacking my head, and I'd have stuff all over the place. So it just made sense at that point in time uh, to call it under the stairs brewing. Um, and okay, the so it was pretty literal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very literal. And then the thrifty brewer came out from just wanting to retweak things a little bit um, and just look at focusing on not necessarily the cost saving side but you know that was a, a certainly a portion of why I got into home brewing but um, how the uh, in terms of just sort of trying to give as much information in terms of cost savings now I haven't really focused a lot on that yet um, but you know with uh, you know some builds and whatnot but that stuff's going to be coming up more in the future but yeah it was it was basically a literal translation to my brewing space and the space that I was given by a uh, by the other cohabitants of the house, if you will. What is it that the Thrifty Brewer does in real life in order to support uh, home brewing? I'm a, uh, a parts and logistics manager at an uh, automotive dealership, a um, little small automotive dealership. So I basically just facilitate ordering parts, receiving parts, inventory, and various other duties as per assigned by the owner. <laughs> That's the large... Um, you know, if you were to look at my job description, you'd have a couple lines and then the rest of the page would be blank. So, um, my big job is, yeah, parts, more or less you could say I'm a parts manager, but, um, with everything else that they have me doing, it's much more than that. Mm. But it's, uh, I've been in the car industry for, uh, for years. Yeah. A lot of hats. Yeah. I'm not wearing one now, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, a lot of hats and it's, uh. It's fun. It's You've a lot of fun. You've got good hair. You I, don't need to wear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. No. It's uh, it's great. It's uh, I've been in the car business for years, and I love it. It's it's nice. It's it's it's. I've done fast paced corporate stuff, and you know, um, it's nice to come back to your roots, so to speak, where it's not as crazy, and you can have some time to spend with your family, and you know, and not always be at work. So that's that's what I do in a nutshell. Where in the world are you situated? What makes the closest big city? Uh, closest big city to me is uh, Toronto. I'm about okay. uh, two hours north of Toronto um, in a little town called Bracebridge, um, which has 16,000 people. Um, and we are in what you would call cottage country. Um, yeah. So basically, we've got... I live in a beautiful part of the country. There's lakes and everything, and in the summer, you know, the place is packed with tourists, and uh, it's a tourist community, um, and you can Google it, and you can see these, you know, multi-million dollar cottages that people live in, and, you know, in the summer, the, the town is crazy, and on Labor Day weekend, which is the last long weekend in um, in August, and leading into September, the, the town becomes completely empty. Um, so yeah, summers are crazy and winters are, you know, chaotic, um, mm -hmm. in terms of weather, at least this year it was, but yeah, it's, it's beautiful where I live. I used to live in Toronto, um, but my wife's originally from the area. So we moved back up here to raise our kids and it was, honestly, it was the best decision we ever so made. So you've got, you're, you're married and yep. you've got two children. Is that right? Yeah. I've got, uh, two beautiful girls, um, living the dream. my wife. Yeah, living the dream. Um, my wife, Tracy, uh, I've been married to her. It'll be 13 years this year. 
um, and our oldest, um, Sarah, is nine, and our youngest, Rebecca, just turned six yesterday. Um, oh, and they are, uh, they're, they're the reason, you know, why you get up in the morning. And they yeah. are by far the most important things in my life, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But yeah, it's they uh, they are challenging at times, but also extremely rewarding, and that's about as politically correct as I can put it without adding bleeps and blurps and and whatnot. Because we all have those days where you wonder why, and then there's also those days where you can't figure out you know why you don't have more. Although that's not going to happen. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, uh, they are. Uh, like I said, yeah, they're the reason why I, why I get up in the morning and get up and go to work and come home. And, you know, you're not always greeted with a mm -hmm. smile, but when you're greeted, you know, with them running up the door saying, Daddy, how was your day? It makes it the crappy days all worthwhile. No doubt. No doubt, mate. And that's what, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's brilliant. We're brilliant. Wouldn't change it for the world. So speaking about things worthwhile, so what you got into, what got you into home brewing? Oh, I started brewing in uh, university, like many of us do, <laughs> um, from a cost savings perspective. And my very first beer that I did, it was a Brewer's Best Stout. And I didn't add any fermentable sugars. I just added the contents of the can and water and made this beer that tasted really that tasted okay but it was like two and a half percent so it didn't really get oh. the job done but yeah. I originally started just based on you know looking at ways to you know to save some money while at school and it's just and then Has I stopped for a consistent while consistent ever since no okay. no no I stopped I stopped for a while I um I basically got back into it again about maybe two and a half, three years ago was when I started again. And that was for the exact same reason. I was looking at, my wife and I were having a very candid conversation about, you know, finances. And she said, do you realize that you spend this much money on beer every, every week and every month? And I said, I did not. And so she said, well, <laughs> what are we going to do to fix that? I said, well, I'm not going to, you know, stop having a beer I'm gonna find another way to you know save some money and make some better beer because that's essentially I'm, I'm a huge craft beer fan we've got a great craft beer following it particularly in where I live um, so for me it was initially about cost savings and then it was also about um, making a better quality of beer because where I live there's a lot of uh, the 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 macro brew stuff is it's around you wherever you go you can't get away from it but we've got some really great craft breweries here who I support whenever I can uh, but initially it was to save money and it was basically um, extract kits starting off with um, you know sugars and I still do extract kits particularly in the winter time when I can't get outside um, and, Where, how you know, did you first learn from did you just know to go to the home brew store and then start from there or did you how did you stumble upon YouTube and that sort of community? Um, I just Google searched making beer at home. Okay. And 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 that led me to, you know, I followed a, I looked at a couple of Craig Faraway videos and I said, Oh, that's not too hard. I dig out a can, I you know, dump it in a bucket and I add a kilogram of sugar, dump that in the bucket, mix it up, throw some, you know, water up there, bring it up to temperature, add yeast and bottle away and sanitize and go all like that. I also had a friend who was into it, who I worked with at the time, who gave me uh, he gave me a couple glass carboys and a bucket. So my initial startup cost was very, very low because he stopped doing it. He didn't, mm -hmm. he didn't he, for whatever reason, he decided he didn't want to do it anymore. He found it getting too out of hand. But you know what they say, once you do your first batch and get the bug, it just goes on from there. And, and right now, it's just the slow transition into, into all grain for me, um, which is so fun it's that whole other level where you're looking at oh my it becomes more of a chemistry lesson than anything and it's like you start looking at you know ph values and you're like oh jesus murphy where the hell am i going to get gypsum salt from on a sunday afternoon in a town of sixteen thousand people 
It's yeah, just not yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you go in a woman of prayer and, you know, pray to God your pHs are fine and you're reducing on your tan and extracting extractions and stuff like that. And it usually works out all right. So who is your main influences for, uh, well, first you first learning and then also, but then sort of expanding on your, uh, on the home brewing craft sort of. What, who are who are your main influences? <coughs> um, you often this you often mention this guy Nick. Um, yeah, Nick is uh, Nick is a good mate of mine actually. I've known Nick since public school, so I'm 42 now. I've known Nick for ages, and Nick and I grew up in the same town together. We went to the same high school, and then we fell out of touch, and then we caught up on Facebook. Um, just out of a whim and um, you know we've got some common interests he's he's a he likes he's into cars and you know um, from a technician perspective um, and we just started talking and he had never homebrewed before so I got um, you know Nick and I have been reconnected so to speak and we come really close in terms of, of being good mates and whatnot um, in terms of and homebrewing is what brought us together um, so Nick is the guy that I got into home rink, um, but for my hometown. So whenever I go see my parents, I pop over to him and we usually, you know, sit down, catch up, have a couple of brews and, you know, he's got family with, with young kids as well. So we've got a lot in common, which is really, really nice. Um, oh, okay. I didn't influence. know if he was one of the guys yeah. that influenced you. Okay. So he didn't no, Well, he, he influences me on a daily basis. I mean, we, we text him or we chat all the time. I mean, influencing and, you know, from, from a non bro home brewing perspective, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a great lad. He really is. And I mean, we get along so well and it's just, you know, when you can pick up a conversation and, and go and go forward with that conversation that you've had with a person three days ago, like nothing has, has changed. It's that type of, you know, thing. Um, who initially I would say who I started following, I looked at, you know, I followed Craig Faraway for a little bit. Um, but you know, to be honest, who has um, made me want to expand my current brewing into what it's working into now um, is you, honestly, Tony, to be honest with you. I mean, I've watched your, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, a little bit of humble, a little bit of humbleness there, mate. But honestly, in terms of watching um, the brewing process that you do with your three tier system and, you know, like yesterday I was asking about fittings and what you would do and stuff like that. So that's where, Honestly, that's my main goal is to get to that point. Um, I just have to, you know, save some pennies and, you know, weasel some money away and mm. slide things under the radar type of thing to make it that takes happen. A but while. honestly, yeah, yeah <laughs> it does. It does. In terms of the process and what and what I want to work towards is what you're currently doing right now. So I mean, that's mm. For for lack of a better term, who's who's influencing influencing me now is you and you know guys like Harry Brew and guys like uh, Larmo Twenty Two and you know S J and the guys that are doing all grain stuff now and the guys that we're basically talking with now because all that information that you're throwing out there on the videos, it's like I'm trying to be as much of a sponge as possible. And, you know, I've seen these, you know, all-in-one brew-in-the-bag systems online, and I'm certainly not going to buy one because I am the thrifty brewer. But I am mm -hmm. certainly going to okay. do my darndest at, uh, at making one and, uh, and going from there. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of cool where you, can, where you can, people can post videos on YouTube, and then you can get as much information from them. And then you can have conversations with them after the fact. That's what I find yeah. really neat about it. You know, that's, to me, that's, you know, we frequently talk about community and and whatnot. And for me, community always starts at home. Um, but it's, I'm happy and very pleased to say that the, the community of YouTubers has spread into my home. Because, I mean, it's, it's, and... I mean, you consider you guys, you know, like very good friends in terms of what's going on because, I mean, you know, it's like it takes a lot of courage to throw these videos up there and and people um, put them up there, balls to the ball, balls out. You know, I'm talking to you at, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning. I haven't had a shower. I'm still in my pajamas. But that's what it's all about, <laughs> you know, and that's okay. Uh, uh, so, yeah, current, 
Thank you very much for the compliment. Um, uh, yeah, it's like, you know, I, you, we're just making videos and sharing them and being part of a community which is bigger than ourself. And, mm -hmm. you know, I started off watching Main Brew Guy and S.J. Poor and uh, Larmer <coughs> started up around the same time I did. Uh, Clemens Homebrew was uh, doing beer reviews before that and uh, those kind of guys. Um, Harry Brew, of course, was a uh, uh, big influence, loved his comedy. Um, He's a character. Paul Wicksteed, <laughs> ran across Paul Wicksteed and couldn't want, wait to watch his videos every week. So, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Um, but, yep, thanks. Uh, yeah, building a system takes a while. Yeah, that's one thing I'm learning um, very quickly. I actually just got uh, um, a side dip tube and a drain... And, and, a, and a drain spigot yesterday so I'll be putting those on this weekend and then I'm looking at okay so now I need to get a pump and I need to get this fitting and that fitting and I'm doing the numbers in my head and I'm just going holy snap <laughs> so yeah it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna take a bit but yeah. I mean it's become it's it's my my wife calls it you know the the other woman um my my hobby of home brewing that seems to be a common phrase from our wives. I don't know why yeah. they say that. They should know, you know that they're the most important thing in our life. Yet, I <laughs> it's just a hobby. They're I our life, but this is just a hobby. Yeah, I constantly tell her. I say, honey, you are, and the girls are, the most important thing in my life. As I'm walking down the stairs to grab a pint of beer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So, talking about your brewing experiences, um, what have been some of your best brewing experiences from with homebrew? Um, I would have to say my best brewing experience was my. Uh, I'm gonna, I have a couple actually because um, obviously my very first batch of of beer that I did. Um, was one of my best brewing experiences because I just couldn't believe that I had made this. And it was a simple Cooper's English Bitter Kit, Kitten Kilo. And it was the most, I was the most meticulous with that one in terms of measuring and sanitization. Whereas now I'm nowhere near as meticulous as I probably should be. Um, and I was really, really chuffed with that beer. Um, I was like, you know, I'd waited and I was regimented. I waited two weeks before I even tried the first one. And then I waited another week before I tried the second one. And by the third week I was like, I can't believe I made this. This is fantastic. Mm. Um, I was very happy with that. Um, now I would kid. say, oh yeah, yeah. I was, I was so pleased. Uh, now I would say it's, um, there's a, there's a number of different ones. I mean, I've made some beers that have been great and I've made some beers that haven't been so great. Um, uh, made a, a double IPA brew in the bag um, last summer, which I loved. I called that the Angry Beaver, and it was fantastic. Um, and that you was come that up was with my set. Greatest names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife. Um, my wife isn't the biggest fan of some of them, but she is the most mm -hmm. important asset to me in the house. So she's okay with it sometimes. Um, yeah, and that was great. I made that for, uh, we have a beer festival every, every year in August. So I had some friends come up and I made, I made a black IPA, uh, that double IPA, and then I made a wheat beer. And the double IPA, I was so pleased with it. Um, but my latest success, I think, was my offensive IPA, which I currently have on tap right now. Um, and that was... That's when I took all my hops and added them into a big bowl and mixed them all up and added 0.3 yeah. ounces every, you know, every three minutes. And it's really piney. So it was like a 90-minute IPA influence, right? Yeah, exactly. It's exactly like that. Um, and just threw it all in. And it's really, the color on it is like ruby red. It looks amazing. And that was an extract kit with just, you know, some additional hops. So I'm happy with that. Um... I'm excited mm -hmm. to see how my Citra Smash comes out because that'll be that'll be exciting for me because that's the first time I did the boiler with the Kegel. Um, so I'll you know, but for me, I've had lots yeah. of successes, lots of not so successes we'll call them, and uh, 
but I've mm. never dumped a beer. I refuse to dump a beer. It just, it's just inherently wrong <laughs> in my books. If it doesn't turn out, I'll call it a sour, or I'll make up, I'll make up some other thing that you know justifies it in my mind, <laughs> where I can you know sell it to my friends or give it away. You know, and I just, if I give it away, I don't mm. ask people's opinion. If I'm happy with it, I'll give it away and say, oh, what'd you think? And if I'm not happy with it, I'll give it away and say, oh, here you go. Thanks for coming over to help or, you know, or it's great seeing you. And it's out. And then I have more space, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> but now they this guy says, well, there's this guy making, yeah, he paid me in beer, but that beer sucked. <laughs> that beer was brutal. <laughs> I am never going back to his place again. So, yeah. so you've had some great experiences. You've had some bad experiences. What was some of your worst experiences? Um, I made a, a Mexican cerveza kit that I got for free from my local homebrew store because it had been sitting on the shelf for five years. Ooh. And it was very bad. It was very bad. It was a Cooper's Mexican Cerveza kit with a kilo of dextrose because I was like, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to invest a lot in this beer because I know it's not going to be great. And mm -hmm. water, I, you know, I followed the recipe to the T, but it came out looking like really, like, like a really weak tea. Like it wasn't beer looking at all. It looked nothing like a Mexican Cerveza should. And the taste was shockingly bad. Um, like a translucent brown or something? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I gave a lot of that away. <laughs> and I uh, and and I had and I had some. But I also made a beer last year in October called Pandora's Box. Which right. um, had uh, iced or yeah, ice syrup in it, which is where they take um, it's basically what they use to make ice wine out of. But they turned it into a syrup here. Um, I used that, and I put in some. Um, what else did I throw in there? I think I threw in some like some some peppers, some Scotch bonnet peppers from the backyard. And that beer has a lot going on in it. There is. I didn't. I made the mistake. I didn't rinse off the sanitizer off of my immersion chiller before I put it in. So there's a slight metallic taste to it. But once you have the once it sits in the glass for a little bit, the metallic taste dissipates. Um, but there's a lot going on in that beer. I still have like four or five bottles in here and I've actually got one in the fridge cause I'm going to try it this Friday just to see okay. if it has even, you know, matured itself into something great. But mm -hmm. that is, um, I won't say it's a failure I, cause I look at all my beers that I make as learning experiences. They, they can definitely be classified as failures though. If you look at your process and go back and say, Oh, I'm a twit. I didn't do this right. I didn't do that. Right. And I, I try not to overanalyze my brewing. Um, I'm a pretty, you know, laid back kind of guy, sort of fly by the seat of my pants, kind of kind of guy like this citrus mash. There's a lot of things that I will do differently next time for sure. Um, mm -hmm. but it's all about learning and it's all about learning from your, I don't want to call them mistakes, but learning from your experiences to, you know, to tweak those recipes down and dial them in and make something that, you know, that's, that's fantastic because that's the ever striving for goal is to make that beer, that one beer that you love and will make over and over and over and over again. And I haven't found that beer yet. And I, I don't know if I ever mm -hmm. will, because, you know, that's always, there's always something new to try. There's always, you know, uh, you know, something else to throw in there. Like, I did not think that in two years time, when I first started brewing, I was like, there is no way that I'm going to be looking at crushed grains and going, oh, if I put some of this in here, it's going to do this. If I grab some hops from this, I'm going to, it's going to turn it into this. Never in a million years did I ever think that I'd be doing this for sure. But <clears throat> that's the joy. It's like, it's like chemistry, baking and cooking all in one where you can just go, all right, let's put it in, see what happens. When I when I cook and when I in the kitchen, I'd never follow a recipe ever. And when I brew, okay. Some sometimes that is the case. Mostly I do, but sometimes I don't, and sometimes you have some fantastic results and sometimes the results are not quite so fantastic. But, you know, like I said, you give that beer away and that's okay. <laughs> Your experience with just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, I mean, you come to discover that some things work and some things don't. 
And it's, it's like you said, you know, it's like cooking. You basically learn in from your experiences. But I hope that you're one of those guys also that seem to be that you also learn a lot from other people's experiences as well. And that's sort of key. As long as you're not always learning from your own experiences, but other people's as well, you'll become a much better uh, brewer much faster uh, in the long run, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the I like to... Yeah, when I brew, I, I do have a recipe there, and everything is laid out, everything is weighed. But then, you know, sometimes, you know, if I haven't used a specific hop before, like, I got on a bit of a green bullet kick a while ago, and I'm still on it. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a big... I'm a big proponent to, you know, taking your and learning from your exact experience and your, your successes and failures. Um, that but, doesn't mean that I do not watch you guys watch the videos religiously and, 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 and take that information and process that in. And it's to me, I learn best. I'm a hands-on kind of guy. Um, but I also, I, ha I like, for example, if I had a, a, a three vessel system like you have, Tony, and and followed your process to a T, I would still muck it up in some way, shape, or form. There is no doubt in my mind. <laughs> but it's May, well, I mucked it up the first four times as well. <laughs> it's, it's a learning curve, and then, <coughs> right? And I mean, after you get past that, yeah, it's falling yeah, in place. exactly. And it's all for me. It's all about the process and dialing in the process, which is why I've got. Um, my, my brother wants to start doing all grain, his second batch of beer. I, and he says, what can you tell me about it? I said, I said, you need to start watching some videos and, you know, grabbing a couple books and reading up on the process and why you're putting, you know, these malts in at this, uh, you know, in this particular volume and, you know, what temperatures are going to be mashing at and, you know, what benefit is that? Um, to the malts and you know if you bring it up to this level of temperature what's that going to do to your flavor profile is it going to leave residual sugars is it going to you know attenuate out dry I mean there's all those mm -hmm. different things that you know now I'm looking at and so now I'm like I've said I'm just taking it all in and trying to process as much of that information as possible which is why I started with brewing the bag because for me I I don't necessarily have the time you know to do you know uh you know, a long brew day, so to speak. This last brew day was four, I think it was like four and a half hours, but we were, you know, mar farting around and doing other stuff in the process. But, you know, the single vessel system that I'm working on is designed to, you know, minimize my time brewing, but still give me a, a great product. Um, yep. And it may when work it comes out. Down to, it, when it comes down to process, I mean, process is pretty big. It boils down to getting your equipment profile dialed in whether it's using brewing software or your own process, taking notes or even working off uh, a recipe on a spreadsheet somewhere. There's a profile in there for your equipment specifically and a what is it, um, you know, mash efficiency, brew house efficiency, all of that stuff. Once you get that dialed in, the rest of it just works itself out. Agreed. Agreed 100%. I mean, and that's what... Um, that's my struggle right now. I mean, because, um, there's settings in Beersmith and there's settings in brew target for, you know, brew in the bag systems, but my, you know, my, my, my dead space is going to be different than, you know, somebody else's and you're absolutely right. I mean, and that's, that's, that's the fun part about brewing. That's where you get into the nitty gritty, roll up the sleeves and you're measuring it. You're measuring them by quarts, and then you know. Well, in Canada, we deal with quarts and liters. It really depends on what's convenient for you at the time. I usually uh, <laughs> measure my initial volumes in uh, in in quarts and gallons, and then convert it to liters when I'm looking at final volumes. You know, and I weigh my hops out in ounces, but you know, we'll convert them to grams depending on who I'm talking to. You know, it really. <laughs> that's. But you know, as Canadians, that's what we do. We we like to you know. We like to, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm getting off topic on that, but, um, ah, well, that's yeah, the nature of brewing in a nutshell, especially in a community, in a worldwide community like this, you're going to run into that. I mean, there's just no way around it. Yeah. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, back to the process, it is all about the process and it's all about, you know, your ingredients and getting to know your ingredients, I think is also extremely important. Getting to know your water is huge. Like we've got great water up here. 
Um, but you know, you're getting to know your, and for me right now, it's, um, it's getting to know my yeasts and getting to know my hops and you know, what's going to, like, as I can, you can, you can read and you can hear from guys that, you know, it's going to give you a citrusy profile. It's going to give you a piney profile. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. But until I taste it, I'm not going to know whether or not I like it or not. And that's all yeah. in the process of me trying to find that beer that I will make over and over and over and over again. Like I said, I've never found it. I don't know if I ever will, but I just have to wait and so see. So right now, I mean, so right now, there's no one beer that you'll make as like your standard house ale. Um, I would make my. I've done the cream ale a couple of times, and I really like that. Um, it's not hoppy enough for me though. But I really want to find a really nice pale ale with about, you know, a 40 to 50 IBU rating. For me, that's my ideal. That's my no, ideal. No. I want to you find want to something that's ale. like, yeah, that I want. I want to find something that, you know, in that mid, you know, yeah, 40 to 50 IBU range. But, you know, it's funny because I can buy a pale ale at the store and I would call it a, I would call it an IPA. But it's labeled as a pale ale, and I think mm -hmm. that seems to be a current trend that's coming along now. Um, is there's 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 confusion in in terms of beer styles, I think, and I think there's a lot of liberties being taken in terms of what style is actually what, you know, and it becomes very confusing. Honestly, I want to find a beer that I enjoy drinking and that I'm happy to share with people. Because to me, that's the most important part is not is, is the sharing part, you know, because it's like I said, for me before Tony is that community starts at home. And when anybody walks into my house, they're instantly a family member. I'll get them their first beer. But after that, you know, the fridge is downstairs. Help yourself. Do whatever you need to do. And my place is your place. And that's the way that's sweet. I'm coming to yeah, see you. Fantastic. <laughs> and that's that's the way. Open? Yeah. <laughs> That's the way. Uh, that's the way my wife and I operate, and that's the way we're, we're raising our kids. Is that it's, you know, our house is is your house, and um, I want to be able to present somebody with a beer, you know, who's never tried a specific style of beer, and have them, you know, you know that little smile you get on your face when you've had that beer for the very first time. You're just like, oh my god, it's so good. Mm -hmm. That's what I like to see. That's what I love to see. And I've had it a couple of times. So I had some friends over uh, last weekend from uh, Connecticut. They drove up here. And and she's not a big beer drinker. And I gave her a cream ale. She's like, oh, my God. She goes, you made this. I said, yeah. She goes, oh. And that little smile, you know, that little that little, little bit right there. Uh, as that a home brewer, you know, you just go, I nailed it. And that's what, that's what I love. <laughs> that's that's what I like. So, yeah, I don't have a specific house ale. Um, yeah, I'm still searching for that beer. But, yeah, a pale ale with a 40 to 50 IBU range, which could be classified as an IPA or a sessionable IPA or a, you know, a whatever the heck you want to call it, IPA. But, yeah, that's that's what I'm striving for. But, yeah, for me, it's all about... I could, If I never find it, that's okay. It's just like, you know... It's like Ahab and Moby Dick, you know, we know how that turned out, but I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, uh, just, just looking for that, that one beer. And if it, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, that's totally fine because I'm having fun in the process. And that's what to me is the most important part, because as soon as it doesn't become fun and, you know, conversely, as soon as it gets in the way of a family, I stop. No ifs, ands, or buts. I mm -hmm. stop and that's done. I took a bit of a break for about um, six weeks. I didn't post any videos because it was just the home was just so busy, and I just I'm like I'm like it's family first. It always has. I remember been, that. Be. I remember that point when you did take a break a little bit, and it did look like that. You know, you had some weight on your shoulders and things like that, and so it was totally everybody in the community. I'm sure that enjoys watching your videos. Sort of picked up on that <coughs> and uh, saw that. So when you weaned off a little bit and you took a couple of weeks off, I mean, yeah, that was perfectly fine. I think a lot of people will end up doing that eventually. Uh, you get a lot of people in this community. There's a high turnover rate. People come in and uh, a lot of people, you know, only stay for a little while and then leave. But you, you, you've hung in there for quite a while. And then uh, 
so it was interesting to see that right towards the the end of that point, I think, you know, after a couple of weeks, and then all of a sudden you got involved with the SJ Poor Challenge. And then there you are becoming the Canadian hub, and then there's new energy. Yeah. <laughs> so how did that come how did that decision come to uh come to be? Um it was really easy actually. Um I I watched a lot of the SJ Poor videos last year and the challenge videos and the review videos last year and I was like, you know, that'd be something really cool to participate in. But I didn't feel confident enough in my abilities to participate. And I think that has a lot to do with people wanting to participate. And so I got to thinking mm -hmm. that, you know, it'd be really neat if we could do it. And it's just something I was thinking about. It'd be really cool for me to send beers to everybody. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, wham, it's global. We've got people in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, um, the US, and, and England. I think, wow, that's fantastic. And now there's nobody for Canada. So I remember going, oh, there's, who's, there's, who's going to handle Canada? There's got to be somebody in Canada. And I'm thinking, well, why not? Why not give it a why not give it a bash and see what happens? I mean, so yeah, why not? Because nobody was coming, no one was coming forward. So yeah, why not? Let's. I mean, it's because for me, it's not about you know being touted as you know having the best homebrewed beer in the world or the best homebrew homebrewed beer in Canada. It's about me being able to send beers to people who I normally wouldn't send them to. Um, Absolutely. And, you know. And, and, and enjoying and enjoying theirs and, and, and relishing in the moment. And yeah, it's really cool connecting with sponsors and they get like so excited about it. You know, they're like just over the moon. They're like, wow, what a fantastic idea. They're like, well, who's judging it? I said, well, we are. What do you mean you're judging it? I'm like, well, yeah, we're doing reviews. And they're like, well, what's the prize? I said, there is no physical prize. It's you have the best home brewed beer in the world, potentially. How many people are signed up to participate in Canada now? I think we have eight. I think we have eight. Uh, I'm hoping for ten. Ten would be mint. Um, hmm. But eight is a nice, easy number for me to deal with. Absolutely. Ten's an easy yeah. number for me to deal with, you know, which is perfect. I mean, and I've done all my shipping cost calculations, and all of our sponsorships have covered all of our costs, and we're good to go. Um, That's fantastic. That's yeah, it's awesome. It's it's really cool. It's 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 really cool, and the fact that it's. Uh, and the fact that it's it's global is even cooler. I mean, like we're sending, and Canada is such a big country. I mean, you know, we've got we've got guys in Montreal, guys out in uh, BC. I don't think we have anybody from the from the East Coast yet, but we've got a couple guys from uh, you know down Toronto way. Um, so yeah, it's it's really slick. And the fact that I'm going to be sending beers all over Canada in itself is wicked. I think that's fantastic. I think, and, and then they're gonna try my beer, and then I'm gonna try theirs. That's what it's all about. I mean, and it's and and now we're making a beer that stands the test of time. So we're gonna be sending them our very best home brewed beer. It's even cooler. <laughs> so what do you foresee your what's your brew lineup? What are you gonna be brewing the next five brews? Five five brews. Wow. Um, I'm planning on, well, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a wheat beer probably in the very near future, just for summer. Um, and then I will be doing a robust porter-ish style of beer for the challenge, possibly, but I have, I still have time, so I'm, I'm not overly concerned about my challenge beer right now. It could be a robust porter, it could be... It could be an IPA. It could be a pale ale with a flate with a IBU profile of forty to fifty. I'm not sure, but <laughs> <laughs> could be the citrus smash. It could be the citrus smash. It could be. I don't know. Um, I don't see my next five brews. I entirely. I'm not sure. I'm gonna do another stout. I'm gonna do another uh, Christmas ale again because that was awesome. Um, and that was a uh, yeah, Christmas sale with cherries, ginger, and cinnamon, and nutmeg. And I still got like three or four bottles of that left, which I plan on saving for this Christmas. Mm -hmm. That'll be doing probably like towards the end of the summer. Get some age on it because it's just turned out fantastic. Um, and I'll do some more. Recipe? I... Now you did. I did actually video on that I, recipe, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. I did. And that was it. And that was off of a Black Rock uh, Nut Brown Ale kit, which was literally. 15 minutes to put it together it took no time whatsoever but it turned out fantastic and you know 
I'm a big fan of, you know, doing what works. And I mean, that's why I still do extract. I still do kitten kilos. I, you know, it works. And if it works, it works. So there's no point fixing it if it isn't broken. What kind of yeast do you use for your Hefeweizen? Um, whatever came in the kit, I can't remember. <laughs> was that the Cooper's uh, Hefeweizen? <clears throat> no, it was a, um, it was a, a kit that I got from uh, a local supplier uh, in, in Ontario, and it was there's it was the it was the Safeal variant, the Safeal uh, half of ice and w yeast variant. Something, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, and I haven't done any liquid yeast yet, just based on shipping and whatnot. By the time it gets to me, I get kind of nervous, which is why I stick with with dry yeast. Um, I've currently got some uh, USO5, USO4, and SB33, I think, is the other one I picked up, which is like a, it's apparently a top fermenting yeast, which I'm going to try and research into that because I'm, I want to expand a little bit on the yeast that I use because traditionally it's just been, I've been traditionally a, strictly a USO5 kind of guy um, and a USO4 kind of guy, but honestly, I. I don't want to run the risk of, of having liquid yeast sent to me because even if it gets here in a couple of days, I, I'm I'm still be nervous to use it because Canada Post can not be they're good, but I'd rather it you know just yeah. know what I'm putting in there before. I can relate to that a little bit. Where if you you, you know the behavior of a yeast then you kind of stick with it because you just got predictable results and then any variation that you have within the beer has probably uh, other influences that are affecting it or you know yeah, that are just influencing it yeah because you did you did a, a video on two different yeasts with the same beer which i thought was really cool um mm -hmm. and i was just like man that's slick so I'm not going to be doing that because I just, I just don't I don't boil the same don't make the same volumes that you do, but I think I'm, I may uh, in the future is try that with you know uh, two and a half gallons you know samples and just do it that way and you know pitch yeast. You could do it with half. these uh, fifteen yeah. minute kit beers as well. I mean you don't have to yeah, use the yeast. Very yeast true. That they send very you. true. Very true. Uh, very true. But now now that now that now that we're doing as much I'm doing as much all grain as I can now I, I'm kind of partial to it because <laughs> it's so fun it really is i mean it's uh you get the smell it's way the oh and it smells so good when you dough mm -hmm. in and then you oh man it yeah it's also the reason why my wife calls it the other woman because she says <laughs> she says i remember when you used to look at me like that <laughs> I, oh the mistress <laughs> i say honey i still do and she's like, no, you don't. And the conversation just downgrades from there. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's, 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 Want you know, a foot so massage? Doing that. Yeah, exactly. Can I get you a beer? <laughs> but yeah, it's about, uh, it's for me, it's going to be about the future. You asked earlier about, you know, five, what five brews do I plan on doing? And I honestly couldn't tell you. It's going to be, yeah, there'll be a stout, there'll be, um, uh, my Christmas sale will be in there for sure. I've done that once. And I really like that. It'll be a couple. It'll be a wheat beer, some IPAs, but the intention is to focus more on the process with my current equipment, and then start tweaking with you know different yeasts and different hops. Because um, I've never used citra before, but you know I figure why not? What's the best way to get to know you know the flavor profiles of a hop? And that's just to do a simple smash beer. So it was 12 pounds of two row and uh, four ounces of citra and then i plan i'm gonna try it uh mm -hmm. take a sample this weekend see how it tastes and that'll determine whether i dry hop or not um because <clears throat> yeah it's it, it smells amazing <coughs> like it just smells amazeballs like it's just like man and it's my experience it's with the citra was uh i don't remember i don't know if you remember but it was very catty at first and it was like, wow, this is sort of farmhouse caddy sort of thing. And, but that was green. Give it three, four weeks, and that will be just fantastic citrus, fruity, bam. Nice. So if, you, nice. if it initially comes off caddy, don't worry. Give it a few weeks, yeah. and it will blossom. 
And that's what, and that's what a lot of people have been saying. They say, you know, it can be like really, you know, mildly offensive in the beginning. But they say the longer, you know, if you give it, yeah, like, you know, about a month, the, the flavor changes completely and the smells change completely. So that's what I'm really, I'm really looking forward to that because, I'm a, you know, I'm a closet techno geek, you know, as we all, as guys all are, you know, I like flashing lights and I like the way that, you know, things work and interact with each other. And so, um, never that good at chemistry, but what really intrigues me and what's most exciting about home brewing is... Like I've said before, the process and buying shiny bits of stainless steel and making them work, but then creating something that you you want to share with with somebody, and saving you know like four or five of those beers after it's all gone from the keg, and then trying them you know six or seven months down the road and just going holy crap the flavor is completely different and looking over your notes and you know, just going yeah I'm gonna make this again um, mm -hmm. but for me it's all about the it's all about the process it's, yeah because we've talked about the process I mean, and how important it is and it's the process and getting to know your stuff and getting to know your ingredients and because I'm still relatively new to all grain particularly with brew in the bag I'm still getting to know my ingredients and, and know how they're gonna interact with each other because I think that's quite important as well mm -hmm. absolutely um, when it comes to the SJ Pour competition beer, so you're not going to go with something that you're tried and true. You're going to experiment and try something completely new because you've got sort of two roads. People who are doing this beer that stands the test of time, it's either something that they're doing that, that has stood the test of time. For example, Larmo 22 is doing the New Zealand uh, IPA because it stood the test of time in his uh, home brewery. And then you got other people that are trying some completely new, uh, off that they've never tried before, and going with that. Uh, which side of the road are you on, sir? I am going for the beer with the wow factor, which is something that I have never completely done before. Now, it may be a mixture of something that I've done before with a little bit of something else thrown in that I haven't used before to make, let's say, sort of a hybrid which doesn't go to any style whatsoever. Um, like I said, if I were to do a robust porter, I would add some stuff to it that would make it a little bit more zingy or spicy, for example. If I were to do uh, a double IPA, I would you know, alter my fermentables a little bit. So it's gonna be, I'm not gonna give too much away because I honestly don't know. <laughs> It's hard to tell, <laughs> but um, it's it's it'll be something cool. I'm looking forward to it. I mean, and I've I've got some ideas, and I've got like three or four recipes that I'm working on right now that I'm just looking at, going, mm, you know, if I take something from here and put it over to here, what's that going to do? Um, but like I said, I still have time. I'm hoping to get that done. Depending on the style of beer, May ish, which is next month. So, hey, mm -hmm. so I've got six weeks essentially, or six days essentially, to finalize my recipe and get it boiled. I'd like to, I'd like to do it. My, I'd like that to be my next batch, so I can, you know, when, get some age on it. When does the registration for Canada close? We are closed on uh, May the sixteenth, I believe, is our registration okay. to closing date, I believe, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, fast approaching. Very fast approaching. And then, and and then actually, the beers yeah. must reach you by August something? I think we're, yeah, middle of August. Third week of August, I think they have to be with me. And then I flip them around and they're, yeah, second week of August, I think they reach me. And then I flip them over within that week and get them out to everybody, which would be which would be fun. I mean, then that's easy. You know, that's easy. That's basically bringing all the beers in. And that's why, like, eight is a nice number. It's it's easy to manage. I couldn't imagine... <laughs> I couldn't imagine having that volume that, you know, Harry Brew is currently looking at, and the guys in the U.S., and even Paul. I mean, but Paul's actually smart. He's got, okay, guys, we're going to meet up at a beer event. We're going to swap beers. And then we're going to yeah. go out. We're going to get pissed. And then we're going to, you know... And then everyone's going to go home. I, you know, that's brilliant. <laughs> Gotta love that. Um, I had... I, I had 10 and I was thinking, oh, that's the perfect number. And now I got 12 and I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's another leader gone. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I like eight. Eight's good. And I was actually, it's funny because I was looking at the bottles I was going to use. Because I deal with a lot of 500 mil glass bottles. And I said, well, maybe I need to go buy some 330s. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, no, I'll, I'll be uh, doing the 500s. But. Yeah, so will I. Yeah, so will I. I, uh, I briefly toyed with doing 750 flip tops, but then I went, no, they probably won't travel too well. So we'll just stick with the 500s and and be done with that. But yeah, in terms of what beer it's going to be, Tony, I couldn't tell you, mate. It's, I, I'm almost at the point where I take the three recipes and throw them up in the air and see what one lands on top or lands at the bottom of the stairs first and go from there. But I don't know yet. From that. I don't know yet. It's still got some tweaking. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You're a hard nut to crack, sir. Am I? Well, wow. yeah, well, I, it's going to be, it'll be something it will be something that will stand the test of time, whether it tastes good. You can look at standing the test of time, you know, in two different ways, in a very much a positive way and very much a negative way. I'd like to be remembered as the positive guy, but yeah, if it's negative, it's negative because it is what it is. It's brewing beer. It's, it's not like rocket that. science. You, it's, and it's supposed to be fun. And if it's not fun, like I said, it, I stop. So that brings me to where do you see yourself as a home brewer in five years? Five where years. Where would you like to be? Uh, mortgage free, debt free. Oh no, that's another question. Um, <laughs> in uh, in five years, I plan on having uh, my brew shed completed, fully electric, uh, insulated, plumbed and brewing out of there exclusively so I can free up the basement for the wife and the kids. Um, I would love to open up a brew pub, but I also like seeing my family too much and I've got some friends in the business and they are never home. So I go there quite frequently and you know we sit down and have pints and whatnot. But yeah, in five years it would be to have the shed completed, a full electric system, off the gas, being able to brew in my shed outside, not in the kitchen, disturbing, you know, my lovely family. As much as my wife thinks the process is cool, she's not a big fan of the smell when you do your first hop addition. She doesn't mind the doughing in. She think that's she's think that smells great, but you know, that boil, she's the windows are open mm. and candles are lit. She's not happy. Even when it's minus thirty out. So yeah, <laughs> five five years outside in the shed, insulated shed, heated shed, with uh two forty uh, for a full electric system and keep working on the brew in the bag system because ideally I'd love to be able to do that and I eventually I maybe move to three vessel but if I get the brew in the bag system single vessel system dialed in I don't see the need for for me personally to go into like using a, an HLT and a separate mash ton and whatnot but no I see that I see a lot of people who have actually I know there's one person who's had a setup very similar to mine where they've actually gone back and tried to simplify and just do an, an electric through in the bag system. Um, yeah. And that's all they do and they prefer that because it's, it's faster, it's more compact, takes up less space and that's enough reasons right there. Do you got any projects coming up in the future like uh, thrifty projects? Um. It's going to be, I'm going to be focusing on the thriftiness of the, the kettle. That's that's because that's the main thing I'm working on right now. Um, that'll be, and that's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, like I'm going to be doing, I'm going to see if I can do a video on the, uh, putting in the spigot and whatnot and, and going from there. And, and then it's eventually going to be, once completed, we'll do a complete review on that. Um, I did. I initially plan on doing a uh, a hop dryer, but seeing as I don't have any hops growing right now, I found found that kind of um, you know not yeah. really cool. Not thrifty. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, I plan on getting a couple hop plants this summer or this spring actually, um, and growing some hops. And that's I think you know I think being thrifty. The cool thing about all grain is that it is extremely thrifty and extremely cost effective like I was mm. flabbergasted absolutely dumbfounded at how inexpensive making a batch of beer was by doing by buying your grains in bulk now um, when I first walked into the house with a 50 pound 50 yeah 50 pound bag of two row my wife's jaw hit the floor 
she asked me if um, I had become a farmer and we were going to be planting, you know, wheat in the backyard. I said, no, this is for beer. <laughs> she goes, her exact words were, what the hell are you going to do with that? I said, I'm going to make beer. She said, there is the head shake and the pause. And she said, okay. Asked me how much it was. And I told her, and I said, it was $50 for the bag. She goes, okay. All right, well, how many batches of beer will that make? I said, oh, it'll make quite a few. She's like, okay, perfect. Because she equates, and my wife is is more thrifty. One would even say frugal. Mm -hmm. And that's being the polite way, that's the polite way of saying it. So mm -hmm. she's, she's all about, you know, saving money. And if it's something that keeps me happy while we're saving money, she's way cool about it. She's, fan, she's over the moon about it. But thrifty projects mm -hmm. will be the keggel for sure. Um, and actually, you know what, I should probably do a review on how I put together my fermentation chamber because that was pretty thrifty. That was a pile of scrap wood and lumber. I think the whole thing cost me like $85 to put together, if that. Um, but yeah, the funny thing hey, is, Sam, Tony, is so that... When I, it comes to that bag that you bought, so it's a 50-pound bag. I mean, you can get like three, four good beers out of it, and it's for the same price as like one kit, yep. one decent kit anyway. So, exactly. yeah, granted, exactly. there's yeast, there's hops that you need to also buy, but you buy in that relation, stuff in bulk you too. do save a lot of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, um, you're very, you're very right. You're absolutely correct, for sure. I mean, um, when I explained that to her, and then, you know, I did get a shipment of hops. I buy my hops in bulk now. They go in the freezer. They go up there in the yep. freezer. And uh, it's... You can, I, my local homebrew store, you know, I can buy three ounces of hops for like ten dollars, or I can buy a pound for twenty. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's you a no-brainer. That's a no-brainer. Don't have to be a thrifty, thrifty brewer to think about that. That's just you know simple dollars and cents. But um, and then t taking all that and then taking all the knowledge and then bringing it all together in one beer and actually saving money at the same time keeps my wife happy, keeps me happy, and keeps the hobby going, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. But yeah, thrifty projects. Yeah, I should do the fermentation chamber. I should do a review on how I did that. But the problem is once I start these things, the filming is an afterthought. And it's like, ugh, I should have started it. You know, I should have started filming then. So... <laughs> half the time I get three quarters of the way done and I'm like you know it'd be really cool to uh, film this and I'm like well I'm not going to take it all apart and do it all again I don't know maybe I'll make a bash paddle or something you know I've got some lumber in the backyard that I can break out the old pocket knife and whittle away like Harry Brew does on his on his bench outside you know <laughs> I don't know yeah no his paddles look uh, top notch <coughs> might have yeah Brewery. they're awesome mm -hmm. they're awesome they're awesome that's for sure but yeah, in terms, of, it'll be the keggle well, for I'm, sure, and uh, that's about it, really, at this point. Well, I look forward to watching the uh, the videos about you uh, developing the kettle and seeing how it evolves, uh, the kind of controls that you plan on using to uh, maintain temperatures and uh, flow and everything else. Yeah, looking forward to it. That's going to be fun. <laughs> Because it's, I, I've got an idea in my head of how I want it to look and how I want it to work. Mm -hmm. The challenge is always bringing that to fruition. And as a software engineer, I'm sure you can understand. In your head, you want to see how it's going to be, but then it's getting to that final. It's getting to that, you know, that that B point. You're at point A, and then you want to get to point B. It's that it's that stretch in between, that can be a struggle. So I've got all the bits and bobs in my head figured out what I need. It'll be, you know, when to get them here and, you know, how it's going to work and temperature controls. I haven't even thought about that yet. I've been looking at stuff going, oh, oh. you know, going, yeah, maybe I make a PID system, but then I'm looking at it going, hey, I would burn the house down if I even tried to make something like that. <laughs> There's, so with the yeah. Bruna Bank system, wouldn't it be probably be best to go with something like, uh, what they call it, the, the burners, the, the one that worked with the stainless steel? Yeah, the infusion burners. Uh, infusion? Yeah, what's it? Infusion. Um, induction. I think it's infusion. Induction burner. Yeah, yeah. Induction burners. Those are burners. Those are pretty slick. Um, 
Um, they are really cool. Um, the problem is, is that they're not cheap either. That's the, that's the scary part. I mean, and you're still going to have to, you know, bring in for the, a larger one that's going to bring up to a consistent boil. I did do a little bit of research into them. You're still going to need, you know, a fair amount of wattage. And, you know, so you could be looking upwards of, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars up here to get one. I would love to do induction burner because I'm not, I like, I don't want to drill as, I don't want to drill a lot of holes in the keg. I was originally going to be doing, you know, the, you know, the hot water heater thing, the 5,000 watt element into the side and, you know, eventually go with like a, like a Pico brew system or a, a PID system just for temperature control on the element and then another switch to, you know, control the pump. Um, but for now, it's basically going to be just gas and super insulate the pot. And when I'm recirculating my mash, we'll just, you know, monitor that. I'll have a, uh, site, a temperature gauge up top, a thermometer up top, so I can monitor the mash water going in and just, you know, hit the burner every couple, you know, minutes if I need to. Well, thanks a lot for spending all this time with me, uh, Mr. Thrifty Brewer, Sam. I uh, really, truly appreciate it. Look forward to watching more of your videos, all of your... Uh, Money saving tips are very welcome, as well as uh, hearing about uh, the family life and uh, the wife, and most importantly, the interest in brew names, uh, the beer names, like uh, <laughs> the Angry Beaver and uh, Angry Beaver, <laughs> whatever else. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was angry, but tasty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> Right on, Tony. I had a hey, I had hey. a hoot and a holler, mate. Had a hoot and a holler. Good. Really, truly appreciate it. Um, no problem, man. Yeah. Anytime, anytime. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank I want to thank everybody who's taken the time to watch the videos and subscribing and liking. And I am honestly, truly humbled um, when I get comments from people. It honestly, I wouldn't be doing it otherwise. I mean, I make beer, I brew beer, I share my beer, and I have a lot of fun doing it. And it's a hobby that you know, I, I want to continue to grow. And the only way that it's going to grow is by people, you know, liking and subscribing and, you know, and making comments because that's the best part. I mean, it's about sharing the information and it's about bringing everybody globally closer and bringing the community in that little bit tighter. I mean, so I want to thank you Tony for taking on this endeavor because it's it's a it's a very big deal and what it it's it's brilliant because it puts a little bit of a personal spin on the person who does the video because you know and I, so I want to thank you very much it means a lot that you're you're doing this and it's it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant and I, I'm well, so very you. looking forward it's to my to, pleasure um, yeah I'm so very much looking forward to seeing who you're going to be interviewing next and what they're going to say like i sit back i crack open a beer i put my feet up and i watch the interviews and i love it i look forward to it every week it's so exciting and um but yeah i want to thank all those the likes the subscribers and all the visits and the comments it means the world to me um so thank you very much as long as you're making videos i'll continue to uh, like and comment because i like your stuff <laughs> Good stuff. I appreciate that, mate. Appreciate that, mate. Okay, Tony. Mm -hmm.